Well, I'm, uh, I didn't get a breakfast. Good morning and welcome to the NMMA Canada Virtual State of the Industry session. Wouldn't it be great to be back to normal? Anyway, um, let's, let's pray for next year. Um, to begin with, a quick reminder to everyone to please be muted and with your cameras off as we start. Uh, that helps us a lot. I'm Andy Adams, editor at Canadian Yachting Magazine and Boating Industry Canada Newsweek Digest. We have a great program today. Sarah Angel opens with the NMMA State of the Industry information, and she has a special guest as well. J.F. Ryu, NMMA's chairman, will take us through the annual general meeting, and then he will introduce Wells Fargo's keynote session again this year featuring Nick Benenbrook with a wealth of valuable business data. We'll have a few minutes for question and answer, and then we'll hold the NMMA Canada Hall of Fame presentation before we wrap up at about noon. There's a lot to cover in just one hour, so buckle up your PFDs and let's dive in. Rebecca, if I can get my first slide up. Um, I wanted to quickly give our audience today the backdrop to the national population trends in Canada. We are riding a big demographic wave that floats our boats, but I wanna say, beware. This chart is the basic demographic profile of Canada 2021 from Statistics Canada census population numbers. About five years ago at this session, I presented a similar chart to help us picture the huge but slow moving changes in our population. This chart shows all of Canada grouped by five year increments. Older people typically are those who can more easily afford cottages and boats. And I think you would agree, your big spending customers are generally aged 55 or older. Remember that every year we all get one year older. So you can kind of picture the wave of our customers rolling forward year by year, buying cottages and boats. From the chart, the number of people who are aged 60 to 64 are set to increase by 9.2% those 65 to 69 will be growing in numbers by 11.9% and those aged 70 to 74 growing at 20.9. Those ages are often when people see their children marry, they start to have grandchildren, and as their careers peak, these people are heading towards retirement. These factors have always been helping boating for the last number of years, then COVID-19 was like pouring gasoline on the fire. Prices for vacation homes rose very fast according to the Canadian Real Estate Association. And whether it's their city home or their cottages, real estate is giving our customers a big wealth effect boost. So things look great for our boating customers for many years coming, but at the young end of the scale, we're in trouble. Ages 15 to 19 are reducing by 1.6%. 20 to 24 is only growing at 2.1%. The people aged 25 to 29 growing at 5%. And frankly, they're probably past the age where they're going to begin a career in boating. So, uh, you know, I, I need to... Yeah. The press conference today is it because of demonstrations that occurred here and in Quebec? Answer, no, it's not because of the demonstrations, but I believe sure what happened there with the audio. I needed to share my perspective with my party, and I also had a duty to myself and to my constituents to share my views on something that impacts everyone. I wanted to share that publicly. Oui, bonjour Hélène Busetti, Hélène Busetti, I think it's my turn, hello Mr. Lightbound. Sorry about that. Um, not quite sure what happened technically there, but if you can hear me, shall I continue? Sarah, could you nod your head? You're okay? <clears throat> wow. That was unexpected. I was hoping for a breakfast and I got something totally different. I, I don't know what to tell you. 
Anyway, let me wrap this. I'll just give you one number to consider. And the number is that there are 550,000 more people in Canada aged 60 plus than there are people aged 15 to 19. Well, who's gonna serve all those wealthy old, older people in the future? We need to attract more skilled labor. I'm worried that we are quickly falling behind customer demand and customer expectations because of staffing. Higher wages will need to be a part of the solution, I guess, but to attract more young people, job satisfaction is also critical. Um, so if we can take the chart down, um, I, I just wanted to say for several years now, Boating Industry Canada Newsweek has supported the Employer of Choice Awards. And I'd like to take just a moment to recognize the marine businesses who've taken the time and made the commitment to their people to achieve award level results in this past year. In the category of manufacturers and marine businesses, we congratulate Prince Craft Boats and Dometic in Vancouver. And in the marina dealer category, congratulations to a perennial winner, Des Maston's Boatworks, Gibbons Motor Toys, and a first time winner this year, Oak Bay Marina. We know we need more technicians, more yard staff, more help of all kinds, but how do we attract the help that we need? Maybe we need to rethink our business model to capitalize on our demographic good fortune because if we don't, we risk losing our customers to other vacation pursuits. So I'll leave you to consider these big demographic factors as the backdrop to the rest of today's presentations. And starting with NMMA Canada President, Sarah Angel. Sarah. Thank you, Andy. Good morning, everyone. Rebecca, you can bring the slides back up. Uh, just a reminder again, just to stay on mute. Um, that way we get through this quickly and, and efficiently. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Rebecca. And then again. So there's gonna be a lot of stats up here. Uh, don't worry about it, we'll share this with you. What we what we're trying to do is just give you a really quick rundown the way I would have in person at what 2021 um, statistics look like. Uh, as you know, we collect data from Transport Canada each month that gives us a look at the retail numbers by segment. So this is a, a, a snapshot of what will be in the statistical abstract. So we took a bit of a pause in 2019 because we thought there were some glitches in the data. And so our, our market intelligence team did a lot of work and we're really proud to have really gone through this data in detail to get you the information. So this is just a look at the economy and cautiously optimistic. We're looking at household spending being up about 14%. Unemployment is, is not too bad considering all the shutdowns and lockdowns and things that have been going on. Inflation at 4.8, GDP 1.3. Go ahead, Rebecca. Next slide. So this is the retail sales by units for 2021. You'll see we're up 15% from 2020 and 2020 was up 5%. What's interesting is that it's almost an all time high, but if we look back to 2011, 12 and 13, we were in that same space. So the economy was doing quite well, if I recall, and pontoon sales were really booming in 2023. So great numbers, but just to, to see the fact that it is the similar numbers to, to those three previous years. Go ahead, Rebecca. The market share seems to be, as we all know, about 51% is re new retail is outboard engines. Next slide. And the sales trends, everything is up. You know, PWCs 21, jet boats 28, cell boats 13, outboard 14, and inboard 16. The only segment that uh, is not up is stern drive. Next slide. The pre-owned market, um, as you can see, has boomed in 2020 and 2021. And there isn't the same trend as we saw for new in 2011, 12, and 13 to what we're seeing in the last two years. So that's quite a, quite a good uptick on the pre-owned market of 5% from 2020. Go ahead, Rebecca. Again, the market share for the pre-owned uh, market outboard accounts for 41%. Next slide. And as again here, every segment is up 
in the pre-owned, outboard 5%, stern drive 4, PWCs 2, that boats 15, and sailboats 6. So it's, it's interesting to see sailboats having some higher trends than we are traditionally used to seeing pre-pandemic. Next slide. This, we collect the uh, engine data each month from our engine manufacturers. So this is our, our data. You'll see, a, again, a, a fairly strong increase in 2020, more modest in 2021, which we're all probably realizing has a fair bit to do with the supply chain disruption and all the things that we've been experiencing. Go ahead, Rebecca. And outboard engine sales units by horsepower for 2020. I won't go into the details here, but my, that's a, a fairly balanced pie, if I do say so. I've never quite seen it. So there's there's quite quite a, you know, if we were gonna dissect each piece, we can, we can extrapolate additional pieces, but it's impressive to see um, the widespread of it. But 52% of all outboard engines sold were less than 30 horsepower. Next slide. The trends for engine sales, as you see here in the chart, we've got a total increase of about 5%. Uh, everything is up except the less than four horsepower and the above 200 horsepower at 25%, which is a fairly significant increase. Next slide. So the rise in voting interest, this goes back to, you know, Jeff will touch on this as well when he speaks you know, Jim and I work closely with Transport Canada, so we obtained this data from them. Uh, you'll see in 2020, there's a, a huge demand for people taking their pleasure craft operator cards while I guess they're sitting at home in lockdown. And while 2021 was a little bit down, it's quite significant still to see the difference. So we've got a lot of people out there who are interested in boating and getting into boating, you know, and we need to do our very best to nurture that and to grow that and to see longer sustainable growth for the industry. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna just spend a little bit on advocacy and some of the work we've done. So some of our wins, um, you've, all of you may recall, some of you may recall there was a, at one point an introduction by Transport Canada to remove the rental boat safety checklist from uh, rental outlets and required everyone to have a pleasure craft operator card to rent a boat. Well, in the spirit of boating safety, in discussions with Transport Canada and many industry players, we felt that that was not a great decision. And we worked with Transport Canada to, to not have that happen because there are two consequences. One was economic disaster for those rental companies who were also closed and people were not traveling to, to rent boats to Canada. And the other piece is that that rental safety checklist is actually really, really amazing education that the new boater gets when they choose to rent a boat which is perhaps in some instances better than just the pleasure craft operator card that is an online test. So we're, we're pleased that we were able to work as an industry together to, to keep things the way they were, which was better. Despite you know, lockdowns and not being able to travel, we did secure $100,000 through Can Export for Associations. And we took Canadian manufacturers to the Marine Equipment Trade Show in Amsterdam in November of 2021. And then our favorite, our un, most unfavorite topic, depending on what we're talking about each day, is the luxury tax. And I know we don't want a luxury tax. And John is here to talk, John Broussard will be here to talk a little bit about that. But it is actually success, because when this started, the government's um, mandate was to put the tax on all boats valued above $100,000. And through our advocacy effort, efforts, we were able to raise that threshold to 250. When we were asked, what should it be? We always said, it shouldn't be anything. There should be no luxury tax. But when we started showing photos of what a $100,000 boat looked like, it looks like we made some impact and they decided to raise the threshold, which saved part of the industry, but not all of it. And we continue to focus on the other pieces. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so on the luxury tax, what have we been doing so far? More than 60 meetings with legislators, government officials and staffers. And in fact, when I calculated this morning, I had remembered a few more that weren't listed. It's more like 70. More than 75 direct letters, emails, dozens of mentions and informal communications wherever we could. We commissioned the third party analysis by one of Canada's leading economists, Dr. Mintz, showing the folly of the tax. And we received, we have some 
earned direct and indirect media coverage in major national newspapers and coverage for one of our Canadian manufacturers, Neptunus Yachts mentioned. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is just an example of some of the coverage. Myself and CEO uh, Bill Jurgen from Correct Craft participated in a podcast with the Boat Boss. They have a huge audience, like I mentioned, the Globe and Mail, Financial Post, and of course, lots of industry communications. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The fight does continue. Um, before Christmas, we did a PR campaign, worked with an agency to announce our third party analysis that shows that we could see 900 to 3,700 jobs lost in our industry if the luxury tax comes in. Now I can't do a raise your hands, but all I'm saying again is, have you written your member of parliament? Have you engaged with them about how this will affect your business? Whether you're a marina, whether you're an accessory manufacturer, whether you're a dealer, it will affect the entire industry from one end to the other eventually. So write your member of parliament, write letters to the editor, to your local media. Let's keep the fight. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we're also doing things outside of Canada. This is just a little snapshot of two letters, one that went from a congresswoman um, to the United States Trade Office which then would put pressure on Minister Freeland that this is bad for trade between the US and Canada. Uh, and some of you might know, I'm president of the International Council of Marine Industry Associations. So collectively with European boating industry, they penned a letter last month to Minister Freeland on the effects that this tax will have on European builders uh, and international builders who do business in Canada. And that's also viewed negatively with our trade agreements with the EU and the UK. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to luxury taxes, which is of course at the core of everything we've been fighting, there are many other important topics for our industry. And this is just a look at some of the things that Jim Wilgosh and I are working on behalf of the entire industry. Transport Canada and a few other ministries have announced a supply chain task force. We hope to engage with the government on how that might help the industry and find some solutions to the problem there. We're going to update our economic impact study, which will be very important in continuing to message things to the government on the size of the industry and the potential impact the luxury tax could have. And then a, a, a flurry of other topics that are important to us all, ethanol, boating access, continuing expanding the Canadian Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, which I initiated a couple of years ago, seeing what the ocean protection plan could do to affect us, fishing restrictions, helping the government look at domestic tourism promotion that helps our industry continue our, our export program. And of course, environmental engagement, whether it's you know working with the government to see some electric charging stations at marinas, further work on abandoned vessels and boat recycling. So we will do Q&A um, after Nick finishes. So if you wanna start putting questions in, into the chat, please go right ahead. So that's my presentation. I'd like to now um, take a moment to introduce Mr. John Broussard, who's Member of Parliament for Barry Innisfil. And before I do the formal in introduction, I wanna thank him on behalf of the entire industry because his, his commitment to our businesses is outstanding. John has met several times with the industry and he met with me last month. And when I just saw his passion and dedication to supporting us, I thought I would invite him to here to speak to all of you so he can share some of that passion that he has and support that he wants to give our industry. So John Broussard, a member of parliament for Barry Innisfil, was first elected to Canada's parliament in 2015 to represent the newly created Barry Innisfil riding and was re-elected strongly by voters in 2019 and 2021. His appointments since 2015 as MP include critic for urban affairs, opposition critic for veteran affairs, Conservative Leadership Team Deputy Opposition Whip, Shadow Minister for Veteran Affairs, and most recently named Opposition House Leader by the intern leader Candace Bergen. Along with his political experience, including nine years on Barry City Council, John's background as co-owner of a sports apparel marketing company with his father has helped him to be a strong advocate for local businesses and the people they employ. Those important skills and experience were more important than ever during the pandemic as John worked collaboratively with the business community to find solutions to new and difficult challenges. Prior to entering politics, 
John was a firefighter for over 30 years and served as an executive member of the Markham Professional Firefighters Association, including a, a three-year term as president. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Broussard. Thank you, Sarah. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear good. you. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I just want to say uh, good morning and greetings from uh, Parliament Hill on West Block. Um, Sarah's quite right that uh, just within the last couple of days, I have been uh, appointed uh, by the interim leader, Candace Bergen, as the opposition house leader. And for those of you uh, who, Sarah said this, I spent 30, 30 and a half years as a firefighter. Uh, this position, they said, was like drinking water out of a fire hose. Uh, everything is coming at you. I can tell you, I've drank water out of a fire hose, and it's nothing like what I've experienced over the last couple of days in this period of transition. But uh, it's an exciting time uh, for me personally, and I'm really uh, excited to be part of the leadership team of the Conservative Party of Canada, serving under our leader, Candace uh, Bergen. Um, you know, one of the things that's important, and I, I learned this as a firefighter, and as Sarah mentioned, I was uh, involved in the labor movement for the better part of a 15 year career, three years as the president of the Firefighters Association. Uh, the issue of advocacy uh, is so critical uh, to your organization. As Sarah said, uh, it was about a month ago or so that I met with her and Jim uh, to talk about uh, the issues that were affecting the marine industry and the manufacturing industry in this country. And as parliamentarians, we get literally hundreds of requests for meeting with different stakeholders and advocacy groups. Uh, and I can tell you from my perspective, uh, one is no more important than uh, my relationship with the Manufacturers Association and the Marine Association. Let me tell you why, because uh, I come from a riding in Barrie in Innisfil, just an absolutely stunning uh, riding. Uh, that is surrounded in large part uh, by Lake Simcoe and uh, Cooks Bay. Uh, it's part of the Lake Simcoe and Nottawasaga watershed. And the recreation industry is so important to our local economy. Recreation uh, and boating represents about $200 million uh, to our local economy annually. I suspect that that number has gone up. I'm using an old figure, but uh, the amount of boaters, the marinas that I have within my riding of Barry Innisfil, uh, Friday Harbor is in my riding, so it's an important part of, of boating and recreation. It really is a four-season destination. Uh, so that's why I take the interest as I do in, uh, in the, uh, the association. The other thing that I would say, too, uh, is when the issue of the luxury tax came up, uh, we met with stakeholders, local stakeholders. I convened a meeting of all of the uh, Simcoe area MPs, uh, who, as you know, have a significant interest in this uh, particular industry. And uh, we met with representatives of the voting industry, manufacturers, marinas, and we heard firsthand what the challenges were uh, with uh, respect to not just the luxury tax, uh, but other issues. And more recently, of course, supply chain issues, which has been affecting the country in its entirety. And so that advocacy is critical. And I encourage you because as I said earlier, we get hundreds of requests to meet with people. And building that relationship is so important. And I think as an association, you can be thankful of the job that Sarah and Jim are doing on your behalf uh, to meet with members of parliament. Now, I just happened to be on here, Sarah, when you did part of your presentation and uh, you said that you met with uh, 60 MPs. Well, just there's 338 of us. So you still have more work to do in terms of that advocacy. But because of it, uh, I've not just been able to uh, write letters of support to the finance minister and the prime minister on behalf of the association, uh, but also to be able to talk about it in the House of Commons and that, uh, that uh, anytime that voice, your voice, the people's voice, uh, is able to be channeled through members of parliament because that's what our job is, is to be representative of the individuals and businesses that we represent and boating, uh, the business marina, uh, and otherwise manufacturing is a key part of my uh, constituency. And that's why I fight hard to advocate on your behalf. 
Canada's facing some significant challenges right now, as you know, from an economic standpoint. Uh, the pandemic has uh, really uh, taxed, if you will, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the patience and the uh, frustration and anger of uh, Canadians. We're starting to see that manifest itself into protests, not just here in Ottawa, but right across the country. And it's important that we as government, I know we, we've been pushing for this literally for the better part of a year, we've been pushing for options to uh, move ourselves out of this pandemic. I don't happen to think that uh, uh, lockdowns and restrictions or even mandates uh, by default are the answer. Uh, this is a, a, a virus that's not going to go away, uh, that we have to use every tool in our toolbox in order to make sure that we deal with it. And so we've been really pushing the government uh, for an exit strategy and an exit plan so that we can create some certainty for businesses because nobody has been more impacted uh, than small business and medium-sized business as a result of this pandemic. And, you know, being a former business owner myself, I, I know that people don't wanna be locked down. Businesses don't wanna be locked down. They wanna be open. They wanna be able to ply their trade and make sure that uh, you know they're providing goods and services uh, to Canadians, and so we're really pushing hard. And you'll see uh, over the course of uh, you know, I mean, listen, we've been consistent on this for the better part of the year about better management resources for this pandemic. But we're really pushing hard to make sure that there is that exit strategy and the exit plan uh, out of this pandemic. Ninety percent of Canadians are now vaccinated. 10% um, are not. And look, let's be frank, we're not going to uh, be able to impose or force people to be vaccinated. So all of those tools that are in the toolbox, we have to make sure that we're utilizing to manage this crisis uh, better. There are a couple of points that I do want to make. Uh, inflation obviously is having an impact, not just on your industry, uh, but it's affecting the cost of uh, everything, uh, heating, fuel, uh, the fuel uh, service uh, charge uh, that the environmental charge is going to have an impact on your industry as well, the fuel service standards. And uh, it's projected that it could raise uh, gasoline prices when it's implemented anywhere from 11 to 16 percent. Uh, this is not the time to be doing that. If our economic recovery is to happen, it can't involve the increase in taxation. It can involve in increases in regulation or pitting industries against each, each other. Uh, I believe firmly, and I mentioned this to Sarah and Jim a couple of weeks ago, that Canada's economic recovery will be led by businesses. It'll be led by the people that they employ, the products and services that they produce in every region, in every sector of this country, including our natural resource sector, because we have uh, within our uh, country an opportunity to uh, promote and move clean Canadian energy outside of this country and the hundreds of thousands of jobs that go with it and the tax revenue that goes with it. Uh, we have to be more competitive mo domestically. Uh, we have to be competitive internationally. And that means a less interventionist government who picks winners and losers based on their ideology. We can't recover from this. We'll requ it'll require us to fire on all cylinders as I said, in every sector and every region. And so Canada's Conservatives are committed uh, to making sure that uh, we uh, create an economy or create a plan to get out of this pandemic by pushing the government to do that. Uh, but most importantly, more, most importantly, let the power of Canadian business propel us uh, and create, uh, create that opportunity for all Canadians because Canadians right now need hope they need a plan, they need uh, uh, a semblance that there's, there's prosperity on the horizon. Uh, the fear and the anxiety that's been created as a, uh, as a result of COVID has been manifesting itself in a way now that we are seeing these protests happen across the country. It's time to lead. It's not time to divide. It's not time for inflammatory or incendiary rhetoric. It's time to, to put a plan in front of Canadians to make sure uh, that uh, they understand the direction that we're going. And I think voting is gonna be a key part of this. We've talked about this in our previous meetings where you know, families have turned to recreational boating as a uh, source of, of uh, limiting that anxiety and that mental health. And we've seen investments in, in boating and, and this is why we need to ensure that we continue to make it affordable. So we're gonna rely on all of you and all of your input and all of your energy uh, to make sure that we propel our economy, propel our country out of this pandemic, and make sure that we're on the road to recovery. We've been focused a lot 
on the last two years on the expense side of the ledger, it's now the time that we need to start focusing on the revenue side of the letter, ledger, and that's opening up our economy and making sure that it fires on all cylinders, like I said before. So uh, I do want to thank you for inviting me, and it's been an honor to speak to you this morning, and I pledge to continue that dialogue uh, between the association and myself and my colleagues as well, and know that, uh, and, and have you know that we're fighting on your behalf, on behalf of businesses and the people that they employ uh, right across this country in our House of Commons. We are the voice of lower taxes. We're the voice of individual freedoms. We're the voice of supporting small and medium sized and businesses, the voice of competitiveness, the voice of a free market economy. And uh, we're going to continue uh, to, uh, to push that agenda here in Parliament. And uh, I really want to thank you, Sarah and Jim, uh, for your friendship and your support, and to all of you for everything that you've, do you've done and will continue to do. It's up to you to propel this country to a state of economic recovery. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you to make that happen. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, John. That's uh, very inspirational. We, we are so blessed to have you on our side and working with all of the other uh, caucus colleagues. So you let us know what we can do to support you as well and in the coming months and, and what we can give back to support um, all of your efforts. Thank you for being here with us and you're welcome to stay to hear the economic um, outlook if you have busy, time, but you've I, got to go to the Hill. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a very busy period for me here. I understand. But, uh, but I do, uh, I do want to say thank you again, Sarah. And uh, like, let's let's look forward. Uh, let's uh, let's work together. You know, Canada has faced many challenges over our history. This is a great challenge. The only way that we can face it is if we're uh, united in our cause, everybody working in the same direction to make sure that uh, that uh, Canada's economic recovery benefits everyone. So thanks again, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for being with us. Okay, uh, I'd like to now turn the podium over to J.F. Ryu, Chairman of the NMMA Canada Board, who will give a few remarks and conduct our quickly our annual general meeting. J.F., over to you. Hi, Sarah, thank you. Um, not sure the camera here is not working, but uh, hopefully Jim figures it out. There you go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to join us here today and, and great to hear from the government, you know, having their support. But uh, also for you, Sarah, thank you for all your government relations update. We realize how important that is. We know the latest challenges to our industry are the top of your agenda and appreciate your efforts uh, to fight for us. Now, unfortunately, 2022 started off with the cancellation of most Canadian shows for the second year in a row, and the luxury tax is coming, but uh, thankfully our advocacy efforts did result in a huge win for us with the threshold being raised to $250,000 for both, while planes and cars have uh, remained at $100,000, so big win there, thank you again. Um, I'm also very pleased that the federal government has announced the creation of a supply chain task force, which will hopefully assist with the challenges we are all facing. It's great to hear the government is finally engaging in this issue, but manufacturing is still significantly affected and the supply chain is going to take a while to correct itself. Our industry is one of many facing supply chain challenges and consumers have come to expect delays uh, we need to make sure that we continue to manage their expectation and frustration and providing the best experience possible that we can while they wait. We do understand it's not easy, um, but we appreciate all the effort you made at that front to, uh, um, for the better good of our industry. 2021 was a very difficult year. We're not out of the woods just yet, uh, but I think we've all learned a lot. And despite these challenges, the industry is very strong. We saw the data from Sarah in the restricted supply environment. So that's incredible. Um, for this, we should all be very thankful. And it's a great opportunity for the long-term health and success of the boating industry. It is encouraging to see sustained increase in people taking their pleasure craft operator card. On the, on the Discover boating front, we've seen a 23% increase in visitors and a 29% increase in manufacturing referrals, representing an incredible opportunities to grow our industry even further. 
further. So we need to harness this interest by engaging in new creative ways. So now I'd like to get your attention and conduct the official annual general meeting business. Notice of the NMMA Canada AGM was given in writing on December 15, 2021. The minutes were circulated at that time, as was the nomination ballot for the board of directors. The following individuals are nominated for a two-year term to serve on the NMMA Canada Board of Directors. Alexandre Bordua, BRP. Richard Brown, Sidewind Marine. Chris Chapman, Volvo Penta Canada. Mark Duhamel, Legend Boats. Frank Hugo Mayer, NMMA USA. And Eric Nelson, Mercury Canada. We've not received any further nominations since the written notice of December 15, 2021, 2021 sorry. Therefore, I have a pre-approved slate of directors for a two-year term. And as such, we have a motion to accept NNMA members Richard Brown and second by Craig Ritchie. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce you the board of directors that are serving the second of their two-year terms. Bill Connor, Stanley Boat, Connor Industry. Krista Spark, Smoker Craft, Patricia Carrera, Wells Fargo, Eric Fetko, Domeric, Hab Gaznavi, Honda Canada, Rosier Grandin, Prince Craft Boats, Lorne Louisel, Mustang Survival, Ali Said, Suzuki Canada, Matthew Hill, Campion Boats, Michael Schwez, Duck Edge Canada Metal Pacific, Cameron Taylor, Outdoor Smart, Tracy Williams, TCF Finance, and myself, Yamaha Motor Canada. Thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Nick Bonenberg, which you have heard from him before in our uh, state of the industry. Nick is a managing director and head of currency strategy for Wells Fargo Securities. Nick offers foreign exchange market analysis to customer and provides commentary on foreign exchange markets through several Wells Fargo publications. He also appears frequently on business television and in media, but his research is often coded in financial publications. So please join me to welcome Nick once again with the NNMA uh, State of the Industry. Thank you, Nick. Great, thank you very much, JF. And, um... If we could put the slides up and um, also uh, I'm assuming my lovely, handsome um, mug will show up at some point as well uh, with the video. Um, but what I'd like to do would be to, you know, basically give some perspectives on, um, you know, we, what we see happening with the Canadian economy and, and the US economy. And overall, we think it's going to be um, a reasonable environment for um, the boating industry, macroeconomic environment, uh, perhaps not quite as good as what we saw in, in 2021, but certainly in 2022, you know, there are still some supportive factors, but also some challenges that we heard sort of being alluded to previously. Um, and uh, just, I think for Jim, uh, I believe my video is like disabled. So if you do want to see me, um, just enable it and I'll start my video. Um, but if we go to... Um, yeah, if we go to the, um, uh, the next slide and just sort of look at what's happening in Canada, for example, the latter part of 2021, we started to see a, you know, a decent recovery um, in, in the economy, both in terms of you know, overall GDP growth uh, for the last month that, that we have, the economy was growing roughly 4% and we were seeing you know, pretty steady gains across the economy. Um, and, you know, and in particular, if one looks at sort of where a lot of that improvement was coming from, certainly the service sector, and as we go to the next slide, that's very much related um, in terms of what we see happening in terms of employment, in terms of uh, housing, uh, the household sector, and in terms of consumers. Uh, because, you know, really, um, obviously, it's been a very difficult and challenging period for many countries around the world, and still remains somewhat difficult and challenging. Uh, but trends in the labor market, for the most part, have been really um, quite encouraging in Canada. Um, so if you look at sort of the employment gains over the second half of last year, they were generally very steady and very consistent. And one thing I would say is that even after the last month in January, and we'll come to that in a second, is that Canada has now fully recovered all of the jobs that it lost during the pandemic. So all of those workers have now come back off the sidelines and are back 
sort of um, gainfully uh, employed in some kind of industry, some kind of activity. And that's certainly helpful just in terms of the overall economy, but that employment growth, that wage growth is also leading to uh, gains in household disposable income, which has grown over the first three quarters of last year as well. And so with that, as we go uh, to the next slide and kind of look at sort of what's happening here in terms of the, the households, you know, not only are we seeing employment gains and also seeing income gains, um, but another pattern that we've seen in many countries, and it's just as relevant in Canada as well, is that, you know, maybe partly voluntary, but partly enforced, um, you know, the ability to spend on some of the things that, that we like to do uh, was artificially limited during the pandemic. And so the, the household savings rate um, uh, for, for Canadians remains elevated. It's not as high as it was, but still the um, saving rate at 11% of GD, uh, 11 of household incomes is still quite high. And uh, Canadians are sitting on a lot of sort of um, accumulated savings over time. So you've got these growing incomes, you've got this pile of cash that you're sitting on. And these should be factors, I think, that would be supportive of you know, ongoing consumer recovery. And Obviously, this is all income spectrums across Canada, but certainly some of these would be also higher income spectrums and would be beneficial for, for industry and for sales in terms of um, marine and boating as well. If we go forward to the next slide, um, you know, another supportive factor for the economy in general uh, for incomes uh, as well is uh, the most recent trends that we're seeing in oil prices, obviously very helpful for those industries, sort of flows through until uh, incomes for, for those companies and, 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 and to some extent through to the workers as well. And, you know, what we have here, the blue line that you see racing up the page towards the right hand side there is reflective of, you know, the uh, global oil prices, say WTI or Brent crude now near $90 a barrel. So these gains in oil prices should be helpful for the economy um, and may be a factor, although we'll come to it later in terms of the currency as well. Uh, I mean, while this might be helpful for the currency, the Canadian currency on the one hand, we have still the issue of what's happening with the various central banks, the Federal Reserve here in the United States, the Bank of Canada as well, and that'll be very important for the currency also. Uh, but certainly from the household perspective, from what we see happening in some of these important resources or commodities, they're all sort of quite helpful for the economy. Uh, there are, you know, a couple of uh, challenges uh, that are definitely mu one must keep in mind. And so if, if we go to the next slide, um, certainly the start of 2022, um, I think, you know, if we go to the next slide, the start of 2022 has, you know, once again, seen uh, another rebound in cases and uh, obviously some restrictions uh, put in place in Canada, which contributed to a sizable fall in jobs in the month of January. We do think it's gonna be temporary. Again, the overall trend is quite good. We've recovered all the jobs, uh, but we can also see in terms of the sort of the business outlook survey that the central bank conducts, sort of two lines or two series that are worth looking at here. The red line is these companies reporting when they're, when they're asked, you know, what have your past sales been? And that red line has been racing up the page. So that again is indicative of the fact that things look better in the second half of last year. The blue line that you see sort of dropping towards the right-hand side of the page though, is uh, what are these companies saying about what their future sales prospects are? And of course, with so sort of some of the restrictions that we've seen in place, I suspect that, you know, that near-term outlook is not quite as good. So despite all of these positive um, fundamentals, maybe there'll be some, you know, modest sort of uh, soft patch uh, for the economy, at least in the early part of the year. And I think the other thing, if we go forward to the next slide, is that, you know, in addition to maybe this, these temporary factors, um, there is this issue of rising inflation. Now, you can see in terms of overall inflation, and this was mentioned previously, um, is close to 5%. Well, some of that, a lot of that is due to higher energy prices, but certainly not all of it. If you take out food and energy and some of the more volatile components and look at some of the sort of underlying measure of measures of inflation, they're still also running close to 3% as well. That's the blue line that you see heading up to, uh, at the right-hand side of the page, even if not as dramatically. Um, and probably these price increases are gonna remain elevated for a little bit. And they're certainly, I think, attracting the attention of some of the policymakers in Canada. So if we go to the next page, 
Um, you know, the, the issue of supply disruptions has been mentioned a couple of times. There's no real evidence yet that those supply disruptions have eased to any meaningful extent. So this is a survey that's done uh, for, of manufacturers in Canada, the, the purchasing managers indices, and it's capturing the uh, supplier delivery times. How long does it take a vendor in the manufacturing industry to deliver their products uh, to, you know, to, to the customer? And the fact that this blue line is going down the page is indicative of the fact that those supply delivery times are getting longer and longer and longer. So again, that's suggesting that the you know, supply disruptions to the supply chain, maybe it's not, it's not captured directly here, but perhaps product shortages as well. All of these type of factors are probably gonna be with us for a little while. And so some of those high inflation readings that we're seeing right now, there's not really a suggestion that it's going to disappear immediately. And so balancing some of the more positive factors that we talked about earlier, employment, incomes, and high oil prices, we do have some of these uh, inflation readings, as uh, supply disruptions. And as we go forward to the next slide, the sort of the price trends are concerning enough that this year we're likely to also be um, contemplating in the case of Canada, a higher central bank policy interest rates. They're worried enough about these rising prices and inflation that you're probably going to be uh, working or operating within an environment of higher, um, uh, higher policy interest rates. So the central bank had an announcement in January and they almost went ahead and, and raised initial, you know, made an initial rate increase there. They, they effectively held steady, but essentially what they said is the economy has, as I mentioned, has recovered over the second half of two, 2021. It kind of looks like we're close to full employment. It kind of looks like there's not a whole lot of slack in the economy at this point. And given what we're seeing on inflation, it's about time we started to sort of raise interest rates. And so with all of that, uh, we do believe that in early March, we'll see an initial move from the Bank of Canada, moving that interest rate from a quarter percent to a half a percent. And if we sort of look over the course of the year, um, we think that we'll get probably three of these interest rate increases. So um, enough, not, 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 uh, you know, not over the top, shall we say, or perhaps not overly worrisome, but certainly uh, an interest rate of 1% while still historically very low um, by the end of this year um, is, is much higher than a quarter of a percent that, that we currently are. And so that'll be a, a modest headwind and something that you want to be thinking about in terms of operating within this environment as well. If we go forward to the next slide, um, I think obviously the other very important thing, you know, as far as Canada is concerned is what about us, and I'm uh, just in case, I am sitting in the United States, in New York City, um, speaking with a New Zealand accent. So a um, bit of a mixture here, but, um, but what are we gonna be doing here in the United States? How are we gonna be helping the Canadian economies? And you know, probably we, the United States will be less of a tailwind for Canada than it was last year. Um, and so, as I mentioned here, here's our sort of GDP forecast. You can see those red bars towards the right-hand side. They're not quite as high as some of the, bar, the blue bars that you see more just to their immediate left. So we are looking at slower quarterly growth in the United States. And as I mentioned here in this like little comment towards the top left, our overall GDP forecast for this year is 3.4% uh, for 2022, which is down from 5.7% in 2021. So that's a, again, a very respectable outcome, but it's not quite as strong as what we saw in, in last year. And what are the factors there? Um, probably one thing that is uh, perhaps relevant is whereas the um, household income trends in Canada are probably very encouraging, if we go to the next slide, um, I wouldn't say that the, the trends in household incomes in the US are discouraging, but they're sort of essentially basically just more neutral um, or returning to a more natural kind of trend. So of course, what we had here in the United States was a, a couple of you know, very large uh, fiscal stimulus packages or proposals. And you can see in terms of the um, uh, household incomes, a couple of uh, periods during 2020 and all, then again in 2021, where you got this massive burst in incomes from the government's sort of fiscal support. Well, now that that has disappeared and with the employment gains being just a little bit slower in the US uh, than um, those in Canada, you can see that the red line there, the sort of the trend of disposable household disposable incomes is much more um, moderate, much more gradual and reverting back to what we had seen previously. 
So that is an important part of the sort of somewhat less support that we're likely to see um, from the US in terms of Canada's economic prospects. And the other thing I would say is sort of moving forward as well, uh, that kind of means that if we go to the next slide and think about, you know, what do what things look like here in the um, United States uh, relative to Canada? And what's another factor that means things might not be quite as good for the United States in 2022 relative to 2021. One is that um, the inflation issues and the supply disruptions, if anything, in the United States are more acute. Um, I mean, they're everywhere. They're in Canada, they're in Europe, but they're probably more acute in the, in the United States and elsewhere. And you can see this reflected in sort of various inflation measures. Here, we're looking at what's called the PCE or personal consumption expenditures uh, deflator. It's very closely related to the CPI that everybody follows. But we're seeing peaks there between five and six percent. And importantly, you can see there that that blue line, the core inflation, is much higher. It's up at five percent. So in the case of the U.S., it's not just energy prices; it's all sorts of prices and, and shortages that are kind of problematic. And so because of that, um, uh, not only you know are we dealing with these shortages, but um, our Federal Reserve, our central bank, has become extremely concerned um, uh, about sort of these inflation trends, and you can see it's likely to remain elevated for quite a while. And so as we go forward to the next slide, um, you know, in the case of the US, we'll probably be even more so dealing with uh, the, the issue or the relevance of a, a Federal Reserve, which is trying to address or, or get towards these inflation issues. Um, and so we're looking, our forecast here at Wells Fargo is for five interest rate increases this year, each of a quarter percent. So we're looking at interest rates being one and a quarter percent higher this year. We're looking at another three quarters of a percent next year. So over the next two years, we're looking at two percentage points um, in terms of uh, interest rates being higher than where they are now, just in terms of the overnight rates. And it's not only that, we do think that um, uh, the, the, and I won't go into the technicalities of what we have here, uh, but we, we certainly think in terms of some of the other policies that the Federal Reserve has been doing, the purchasing of government bonds and now the sort of essentially effectively selling or reducing its holdings of, of treasuries and government bonds will also be pushing up at, at some point, we think, the longer term bond yield as well. So these uh, higher interest rate environment is, is also another factor that really does contribute to that slower kind of uh, growth that we see um, in, in, in the U.S., and not only that, as you can see here, we're a little bit more active um, in terms of higher yields in the US, higher interest rates in the US. Uh, you know, there's certainly some movement on that front in Canada, but more so in the case of the United States. And so this greater activity will have some um, relevance and influence for what's happening in terms of the US dollar Canada exchange rate um, as well. And so if we move to the next slide, I, I, I hope or believe that we do have um, some figures that are sort of worth mentioning. Let's first look at the top table, and I'm probably going to have to do some uh, quick mental arithmetic, and I'm not going to do a very good job, unfortunately, but I'll try my best. Um, so in, in terms of GDP growth, the first thing I'd focus on is really just 2022. It's the third column there. You can see in the case of Canada, 4.6% growth in 2021, slowing down to 3.8% in 2022, uh, 2022. Still a very respectable outcome. But as you can see there, the slowdown in the United States is more dramatic, down to 3.4%. And as I mentioned, uh, the US economy likely to be less of a tailwind, even though the outlook, outlook remains respectable. And as I mentioned before, um, the, the uh, you know, US dollar uh, or the Canadian exchange rate very much likely to um, um, uh, be softening because of the much more active um, move uh, uh, on, on, in terms of those interest rate increases from the Federal Reserve. So in terms of the way, and I apologize, my, my, aging, my aging mind is not quite as sharp as it used to be. So I'm gonna actually just sort of do this properly so that I don't make any mistakes here. Um, so you can see here, in terms of the way that we think about it, we have the US dollar getting stronger against Canadian dollar, um, purchasing $1.31 Canadian um, by the middle of next year because of those faster interest rate increases from a, you know, around about 126, 127 um, from where we are now. Now with my trusty iPhone uh, with the calculator app on it, what does that actually mean in terms of how many of you would be thinking about this? 
you know, we're currently maybe 79. If you, if you had one Canadian dollar, we're probably around 79 to 80 cents uh, uh, US at this particular point in time. And it, when we see that moving down to, towards the 131 level, um, or, or when we see that moving over time, you're probably looking at that figure going from around about 79.80 down to about 75 to 76 cents. So we've got about a four cent weakening in the Canadian currency as well, which is another thing you'd want to be, uh, I think, thinking about. So with that, I would want to thank you very much for the opportunity to offer some brief high level perspectives. Um, if we go to the next slide, I believe we've got to the end of all the relevant presentation. Disclaimer is obviously always very important. Um, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll hand it back um, to uh, the next speaker to conduct um, the, the next part of the session. All right, that would be me. So thanks, Nick, much appreciated. Um, I see we have one question in the chat. So if, if people would like to uh, type their, their question, I can, I can get to it or I think we have time if, if someone would like to raise their hand and ask uh, the question over video, that would be okay as well. So if you just go to the bottom right of your screen under reactions, there's a raise hand button, but I'll, I'll ask the one that we've received in the chat. Um, Nick, the questioner asks, has the increase in consumer savings resulted in any decrease in overall personal debt ratios? Um. So I haven't, there, there has been an overall trend towards a decline in over, overall um, debt ratios, um, although more so in the United States than Canada. As, as, I, as I look towards it here, um, I, I, I think it's led probably to a very small decrease, um, but there's a little bit of an interplay going on here as well, because I think while probably the overall level of debt has likely decreased, the, the rebound or the recovery that I mentioned in, in household incomes has basically recovered some of what you lost during the pandemic as well. So sort of two things are moving, sort of the, the level, I think the overall level of debt is down, but there were some quite significant gyrations in terms of household incomes during the pandemic. And so at this point, from recollection, con consumer incomes, you know, household debt relative to consumer incomes in, um, Canada is still pretty high. It's around about 150 to 160% of um, consumer incomes. And I don't think it's moved down meaningfully to any extent. I'll check what the exact figures are. Um, but, you know, I follow these. I see them every three months or so. And, uh, you know, if there had been a dramatic move, I would have noticed that. So at this point, I would say it's come down slightly, maybe by five percentage points or so, but hasn't come down massively at this particular point just yet. Okay. Um, thank you. A another question, um, and this is this is certainly relevant to to our industry. Do you expect to see a, a major or dramatic shift in consumer spending away from durable goods and back toward the service sector uh, in 2022 and and, and beyond? Uh, yes, yes, we do, uh, or I, and I and I do, um, and it's a pattern that we um, have seen already, both in Canada and also in the United States. Um, you know, when you look at the consumer recovery or the consumer spending recovery, it has very much been on the sort of the durables, the big ticket items, um, you know, people getting TVs and sofas and boats, for example, and various bits and pieces. Um, and, you know, as we all wait for the day where things are more normal um, in terms of just the ability to travel and, and partake in, in activities, you know, certainly as people get on planes and take vacations and go to restaurants and get back to just, you know, I obviously don't need a haircut uh, like a lot of other people, but just get back to these service activities. Um, we do think very much that there is going to be some move towards more of just going to the movies, going out for dinner, going on like a regular vacation. And so in that sense, we do expect that that it will be, a, you know, a little bit of a diversion away from some of the durable type spending that we've seen previously. And one can already see some of these patterns starting to emerge in the most recent quarters. Great, thank you. And we've got time for one more. Um, I guess this, this is a, a, a comment, but I, I would just ask you to maybe opine on it a little bit. If, 
if oil prices are going up, um, one would expect the Canadian dollar would increase rather than decrease. I don't know if you want to comment on the relationship between those two. No, it's a very fair point, and uh, I would agree. Um, and so, you know, uh, let me let me thank you for the question and thank you for the comment. Um, I'm humble enough to know that I've been doing this for 20 to 25 years and I'm still struggling to get it right all the time. So um, uh, what I would say is that, you know, one of the charts we showed um, had the, the oil prices or the commodity price index is generally would it suggest a much stronger Canadian dollar, um, perhaps than, than what we're suggesting. Um, I mean, the other factor that has sort of come into play there is that interest rate dynamic as well, though, and the fact that the Federal Reserve is going to be raising interest rates a lot more quickly. So I think what I would say in response to the, the comment would be simply to say that probably, you know, we do take account of the higher oil prices. And it's probably one of the reasons that we talked about the Canadian dollar going from, say, 79 cents down to 76 cents and being a relatively modest or small decline in the currency. Um, but it's certainly a risk factor. And like I said, it's, it's certainly it's possible that that, you know, this high oil price becomes more powerful than I expect. And in terms of our outlook, in terms of our forecast, specifically as it re relates towards the currency, you know, if you were to ask me, am I going to be wrong? I would say, I hope not. But if I was going to be wrong, what's the balance of risks? What's the direction of risks? Um, I do think that, you know, the Canadian dollar, if anything, may be more resilient and, and might not weaken any as much as we, we currently anticipate. Great, thanks. And so I, I'm going to throw you one more bonus question, just because this is a topic that is that is coming up. Uh, uh, it's a bit of a curveball around cryptocurrencies. Do you have a prediction regarding the the future value of crypto? Like, how how is that being forecasted, and and what impact do you think crypto will have on on retail sales? Um, that, that is, thank you. And that is a bit of a curveball. Um, I know it's called a currency, but it doesn't quite have the same characteristics as a lot of the other currencies that I tend to follow. So, uh, you know, I looked at this a long time ago, several years ago. Um, I, I really don't have any price predictions per se um, on, on crypto. Um, I do think that, you know, there was, I think, one comment or one question. To the extent that the cryptocurrencies remain elevated, uh, you know, and say Bitcoin goes back to 50 or $60,000, it might help some spending on high-end items, you know, is maybe some of that is liquidated and applied towards, you know, big ticket items, cars, um, other leisure activities, boats, that kind of stuff. So I can see how that would be a supportive factor. I personally don't follow the sort of whole crypto environment closely enough to opine with any real particular insight on the sort of, the, shall we say, the quote unquote fundamentals to the extent that they exist within this industry. Um, however, I think the overall thing I would say, and, and again, it's too early for me to suggest whether this is a um, uh, sort of a, a bubble or not, it, but a lot of these currencies, cryptocurrencies, you know, are all very much essentially dependent or the value stems from the willingness of individuals to accept this as a form of payment or a form of wealth. And although I don't really have necessarily particular insight into the underlying mechanics of a lot of these currencies and how they work, um, it seems to me, at least for the next, I don't know, 12, 24 months, for the foreseeable future, it does appear that there is going to be ongoing willingness for this to be accepted as a form of payment or a form of wealth. It's becoming more widely accepted. And so regardless of whether or not there's fundamental value there or not in these currencies, the fact that there is perceived value and I think a willingness of individuals to accept payment or wealth in this form, um, I suspect that if anything, the price will continue to trend somewhat higher from where we are, where we are here. Great, thank you. Well, that's, that's all the time we have for questions. So thanks again, Nick, for your, your, your expertise and, and uh, your insights and I will, now hand things over to JF for the final item in our agenda. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Nick, for your insight and your presentation. We really much appreciate that. 
All right, so now it is my honor and privilege to announce this morning that the 2022 Hall of Fame recipient is Tom McNair. All of those who know Tom will know his contribution to the boating industry are deep. In fact, he served on the NMMA Canada board and drove the Discover boating for many years. So Tom, you have always been a leader and contributor to our industry and are so deserving of this award. So now I'd like to invite Brian Don, friend and colleague of our inductee to conduct the NMMA Canada 2022 Hall of Fame induction. Brian. Um, hello, and uh, thank you. Thank you, JF. Uh, I don't know that I expected uh, that I'd have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to address uh, this group as a whole. Uh, I've been uh, away from the industry for, uh, uh, for three years, and uh, I miss it. I miss it often, and uh, especially miss it this time of year uh, during boat show season. Uh, I have to say that uh, Tom and I have worked together for a number of years. Certainly count him uh, as, a, uh, as a friend and colleague. Last Thursday, I had, uh, had an opportunity to get a call from Tom. And uh, as we got caught up on uh, uh, what's going on in our collective worlds, he also uh, asked for a favor. And that doesn't happen often from Tom. So uh, he went on to tell me that he had received a call from Sarah, making him aware that he was uh, uh, about to be where we are right now, uh, inducted to the uh, NMA Canada Hall of Fame. And, uh, and would I uh, do a brief introduction? And I'm, uh, I'm happy to do that. I have to say, uh, one of the pieces that, uh, uh, that I had a chance to, uh, uh, to read and, uh, and read a number of times over the weekend uh, is a piece that uh, our own, your own, uh, Andy Adams wrote uh, back in uh, late 2016 or early 2017. I learned from that, Andy. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff in that. Uh, I guess what I want to do is just talk about uh, Tom as a volunteer. The group that's on this call, uh, they know how involved Tom is. And uh, yet at the same time, he managed to do all of this, still managing or still maintaining uh, senior responsibility uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the boat group, uh, something that he joined. Uh, in uh, Help Me Tom uh, 2001 or a little after that, I guess. And uh, so when, uh, when alignments were redone, uh, Tom ran with it, joined the group in a big, big way uh, in senior management and uh, took care of the Canadian market. I worked with Tom, uh, reported to Tom uh, with my fiberglass boat brands uh, uh, at the time and it was certainly a, a pleasure. He and I, along with the rest of the team, traveled extensively. Uh, certainly a number of people on this call, again, know just how much uh, time we can spend away at shows. Uh, but Tom, was, uh, Tom wasn't Tom was one of the guys that uh, uh, came in on Friday and left Saturday morning. Uh, Tom was uh, at shows right across Canada, uh, coming in midweek, lots of times uh, uh, helping with setup. And, uh, and staying and working the floor, so to speak. We all know what that term is. And uh, so it was certainly a pleasure to, uh, not to spend time with him. Uh, he's, uh, he's a boater, but he's a number of other things ahead of that that uh, was in Andy's uh, uh, detail. Uh, he was a teacher. Uh, he's a Harley rider. Uh, he's, uh, he worked for a beer company. I mean, there are so many things that Tom has done ahead of joining the Marine Group that uh, we could have lost him. He, he could have been he could have been doing this with a uh, uh, with the motorcycle uh, association just as easily as where we are today. I have to say that when uh, when Tom wasn't doing shows or wasn't able to do all the shows, he would make commitments to be at an, uh, a dealer's show the following year, and then we would travel to their locations during the summer months. Tom's not a good traveler that way. Uh, GPS is not his friend, and uh, as much as uh, he's a calm, collected character, I've watched him lose his stuff a couple of times with uh, GPS. He would far, far uh, uh, more welcome a map. 
one trip uh, to PEI, we finally did stop and get a map. And it didn't help a lot because he was uh, still late on, uh, uh, on co-piloting. Every time it, I, I was supposed to turn, it was, well, you should have turned back there. And that's all well and good. Uh, Tom, uh, pleasure to uh, uh, spend time with you. Uh, as I said, count you a friend. Uh, if we were to do statistics on uh, uh, what you've done over this uh, uh, 20 plus years in the marine business, no one has sold more boats. No one has had their fingers all over uh, the number of boats and product that, uh, uh, that you've been involved in creating uh, and uh, moving through at uh, wholesale and retail. How you've been able to uh, uh, lay over that, uh, all of the things that you've done from a volunteer standpoint is nothing short of amazing. Uh, I think what you managed to do is stretch a day from 24 to maybe 28 hours. When we would travel back from uh, some, of the, some of those meetings, as much as I was going home and putting my feet up for a couple of days, you were just going home packing a bag and maybe heading to Chicago or uh, uh, other points of interest for, uh, for meetings. So uh, hats off to you. Uh, I'm proud of you. I thank you for an opportunity to do this for you and with you. Um, I'm going to hand it off to you. We promise to be uh, uh, to have brevity in this. We'll see how that plays out. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I definitely appreciate the introduction, and I sincerely appreciate you telling the stories and telling tales of my mag magnificent uh, GPS reading. You know, and get that damn map, Brian. I can't figure out where we're going. That was good, Sarah JF. Thank you very much for hosting yet again, a very successful and very significant and important meeting uh, in our industry. Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, MP Brizard for his comments, you know, uh, very enlightening and, um, and, and sir, as you said, very inspirational, you know, lets us know that we've got somebody in our corner, you know, somebody that is important in our corner, that makes a huge difference. You and I went to the Hill a number of times and had a number of different temperature type of meetings from they couldn't have frozen us out quicker to a meeting like a uh, meeting with uh, John Brizard. So that's absolutely wonderful to hear. Um, Nick, as always, um, you know, I, I hang on what comes from the, uh, the Wells Fargo team when it comes to our economic forecast, because they always offer um, such incredible insight. I, I really, truly appreciate that. I, I think the old joke about never follow kids or pets on stage should be expanded to never follow kids, pets, uh, M uh, MPs, uh, or Nick. You know, because when you bring up the rear after Nick, you know, uh, you wonder how the heck you're going to have an impact. But thank you again uh, to what uh, you folks brought to the meeting. That was very important. Um, I had a funny call last week. Sarah called me to tell me that I was the 2022 Hall of Fame inductee, uh, and and she was met by something I'm sure that those of you who know me and and Sarah especially never thought that she would get dead silence. Um, I was, yeah, it didn't click on me what she was saying at first that I was the inductee. I've sat on a lot of the committees that kept, that, that, that picked this you know, um, inductee for this um, uh, award and worked with these people closely. And it, it didn't, it didn't really kind of compute right away that I was the one being chosen for this honor. I did a quick mental inventory. Um, I didn't design a world-renowned sailboat. Uh, I didn't start what is now an industry-leading aluminum fishing boat company um, in a small shop in Northern Ontario. And I sure as heck didn't perfect um, the engineering performance advancements of one of the major manufacturers of PD, PWCs in the world. I'm, I'm just a sales guy. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, the old, why me? Um, but I am a sales guy that was blessed with the opportunity to give back to the industry. I love this industry. I grew up in it. You know, Andy reminded me, you know, with the, the columns growing up in my dad's boat plant when I was a kid, uh, scrubbing the toilets and sweeping the floors and grinding the flashing off the molds uh, of his fiberglass boats. I've been around this a little bit of time. When Andy interviewed me, I was 62 years old. I might have aged a little bit <clears throat> since then. At that point, I'd, I put 56 years into the marine industry. So, you know, my, my dad whooped me into shape pretty good and pretty early. Um, 
I am, I'm very fortunate too, to have had the support of the companies I've worked for, the two major companies I've worked for in the industry, um, allowing me the time to, um, to uh, share my passion uh, with serving on the board of MMA, uh, CMMA, um, both Genmar initially and Brunswick Corporation later on, were very good at allowing me the time away from my real job you know, to, to do the things I felt was important that we do, given our positions in the industry, to support the industry. And for that, I am truly thankful. Um, yeah, it, I, I started, I joined the board of directors back when it was CMMA. We came in and made Canada. Discover Boarding kind of came along as part of the deal. Uh, and without the support of my employers, um, uh, this wouldn't have been possible. They were an integral part of that journey. Uh, and, and to everyone's corporation, everybody who's, you know, on this meeting today and is allowed to participate in what we do for the industry, thank you to your, to your corporate heads, you know, for understanding that these are important things for us to do. Um, my time as a, a board member uh, and eventual chair of CMMA, MMA Canada, and Discover Voting was incredibly rewarding, incredibly rewarding. I believe that would have not been the case without the considerable talents and support of the staff, the volunteers, and the industry board of directors that serve the NMMA. They work so hard, give so freely of their time and efforts, to ensure the success through good times and challenging times, and we all know we've had a few of those uh, over a number of years, of the boating industry overall. Yeah, and what's most important, what I always enjoyed when we got together as a group, was that everybody left partisan thinking and what's in it for me at the door. We were there on behalf of the industry. That's a big deal. You know, everybody's got you know a corporate master or a banker to serve, and to be able you know to leave that behind and say this is for the industry i really truly appreciate and thank those of you that served with me on these boards for doing that it really helped to continue the success of of our industry and and that brings me to why i'm so grateful uh, to receive this award um, i i thought about it and i realized that this is not an individual award this year uh, i'm not the recipient for things that i did on my own uh, I'm the unbelievably lucky person who, who simply got to contribute to and in some small part way lead the group of people that I, I just described and that I, I talked about. And I'm very, very, very fortunate and blessed to have been able to have done that. Um, I just thought it was, you know, a part of what you do, you know, when you believe in what you do. Um, this year, um, this award is not again to see an individual. This is a team award. This goes to everybody that I talked about, everybody that we work with, everybody who supports this industry. You know, I really, truly am honored. I, I congratulate you folks for your efforts and the things you've done for our industry. You know, and thank you for allowing me to accept this award on your behalf. Keep our industry strong and vibrant. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. You're an inspiration and you've been so supportive of all of my time with you. And I couldn't have done what I had done during your time as chairman if it wasn't for you. So thank you back on behalf of everyone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. I sincerely hope we will all be together doing this in person next January at the Toronto International Boat Show. It's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed the session. And if you have any questions that were not addressed, please feel free to email Jim and I. Thank you very much.